Thank you, Rob. If there are any uh, died in the war Norman Brewley fans in the audience, leave now. <laughs> Norman, you were an incredible aviator. You were a very fine businessman. You wrote a damn good book. But why did you leave out all the naughty bits and the interesting bits? Well, here comes volume two, Norman. I hope you enjoy it. A, pi a pioneer, as Norman really was, is, is always in trouble. Because while he leads the way, he's also unfortunately the first person to start making the mistakes. And while Norman led the way in aviation, uh, commercial aviation history in, in Western Australia, and also in Australia, really. He also made a few little slips along the way. And he, be but being Norman really, he became an absolute master in either blaming somebody else or pretending it never happened. Uh, and there was lots of parts of his book where you turn the page over to find out what on earth happened, and there was nothing further said. <laughs> well, today there will be. Norman had two goals. The first was to establish civil aviation on a commercial basis in Australia and Western Australia. And the second was to make a lot of money for Norman Brewley. He was never reticent about that. that that's what he really went into aviation for. And there's nothing wrong with that. You don't start a business to, uh, uh, to, to run at a loss. You start a business to make some money for yourself. Um, after he'd sold his... Um, barnstorming outfit to Macintosh in January of 1921. The next thing, what was he going to do? Well, he went off to Melbourne for a holiday to try and get his health back. He was still not very well after the war wound he had. And while he was in Melbourne having a bit of a good time, he introduced himself to Horace Brinsmead, who we've already seen, who was the controller of civil aviation. And Horace said to him, Norman, you're just the man we want to see. Um, we're going to start up a, a, a subsidised airmail service, aerial airmail service. Uh, we, we've picked out three possible routes. Uh, we're going to subsidise the service because we've been told by the British people that, uh, in the Air Ministry in England that you can't operate an, air, an aerial mail service at a profit. Air, aircraft are expensive, they've got a very short service life, um, they only carry a very small number of people, uh, they've got to be subsidised. But he said, we, we have the faintest idea how much we've got to subsidise them. Can you give us a bit of a hand? <laughs> so Norman said, yes, actually I can. <laughs> he said, I know exactly how much it costs to offer an aeroplane. He said, I've had these two Avros. He said, it cost me 16 quid an hour to fly them. I cover 80 miles in that hour. Now 16 quid is 320 shillings, and you divide 320 by 80 and you get four, it's four bob a mile. And Brinsley said, well, that's, thank you very much, Norman, that's most interesting. He didn't tell Norman that they'd already had two quotes. Um, the British government was subsidising uh, Daimler, Handley Page and Instone 16 shillings a mile to fly the, the mail from London to Paris. And the Australian Army Air Force had already been asked by the government to give a quote on flying from Geraldton to, to Derby and they'd wanted 13 shillings a mile. Mm. Well, this sort of put Norman right at the front of the queue. So Brinsmead said, well, we're going to advertise some tenders very shortly uh, for a service from Geraldton to, to Derby. It can't be from Perth because there's a railway from Perth to Geraldton and the rule is you never fly and compete with an, an existing form of transport. So uh, keep your eye on this space, Norman, and, and uh, drop us a line when the tender comes out. Well, it came out in June. Norman applied. He proposed to use six Bristol tours, which were civilianised uh, Bristol FTB fighters, uh, f five or six pilots, uh, and he would have bases at Geraldton and Carnarvon and Onslow and Broban uh, and Broome. And uh, he asked for the maximum subsidy that the government was offering, which was £25,000 a year. The £25,000, of course, had been calculated 
that it was 2,400 miles up to Derby and back, and at four mile a mile that worked out to 24,937 pounds, and so they, they rounded it up to 25,000. Norman only had one serious competitor, uh, a bloke from Kalgoorlie, Arthur Simpson, he was the head brewer and part owner of the Union Brewery in Kalgoorlie. He was a wealthy man, a middle-aged, a, a fanatical aviation enthusiast, wasn't a pilot, and he put in a tender for only 16,000 pounds using three Armstrong with FK8 clunkers that he was going to buy from the Airpark, Aircraft Disposal Commission in England. It, was, it wasn't even a competition, they, they picked Brewery straight away. So, on August the 2nd, Norman was told that he got the contract. Now, that started uh, probably the hardest four months in Brewery's life. Uh, the service had to start on December the 5th. He had to get six aircraft from England, put them together, test fly them, employ five pilots, get all the insurance arranged, advertise, establish hangars on the landing grounds, get hold of ground staff. It was a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. He also had to start a, a, a company. Now, straight away, he did something rather smart. He had got the contract for this service himself, personally. So he got some Perth businessmen together to start a company called Western Australian Airways. And he said, I will sell the right for you to use this contract for 5,000 shares, one pound shares in the new company. So that was 5,000 bucks, or 5,000 quid in Norman's pocket right from, right from the off. Um, so the company was floated with 25,000 shares, I think it was, no, that was a nominal capital of 50,000 pounds, but they offered 20,000 shares to the public. Um, now Norman whizzed over to Melbourne to start testing the people who'd applied for pilot, as pilots. He got a lot of applications. Uh, he narrowed it down to about a dozen on paper, and he went over to Melbourne. The Civil Aviation Branch allowed him to use their Bristol Tourer, which they owned as a test aircraft, and uh, he went out to Point Cook, tested all these people, and he picked five. From New South Wales, Len Taplin and Charles Kingsford Smith, from South Australia, Bob Fawcett, and from Perth, uh, Val Abbott and Arthur Blake, and of course he was the sixth. Um, the aircraft came out from, from London, uh, all crated, and they were landed on the wharf on the 16th of November, and the Bristol Aircraft Company were so impressed with Norman and the way he was going about it that they sent them out free on wharf. They didn't even want any money until they hit the wharf at Fremantle, which was a great help to Norman. While he was in Melbourne doing all this testing, he got an unfortunate cable from Perth. We can only sell 9,000 shares. That was 9,000 pounds. Now the aircraft are 12,000 quid. You ordered 2,000 pounds of spares, and you want 2,000 pounds for your hangars. You're in trouble, big trouble. Norman, with characteristic vigor, cast his net around in Melbourne, and he, he was got an introduction to a man called H.V. McKay, who operated the Sunshine Harvester Company. He went out and saw McKay, and McKay was so impressed with Norman, he must have been a very impressive speaker. And McKay said, how much do you want? And Norman said, I want another 8,000 quid. He said, right out, um, if you can talk the federal government into lending you the money, I'll guarantee it. So there was much negotiating, and Brinsmead came into the act, and finally the Treasury were induced to advance Norman 8,000 pounds from the 25,000 that he was going to get for his first year service. Problem solved, but not really, because when the aircraft landed, the 8,000 pounds hadn't come over to Perth, and it required an urgent telegram from Jimmy Mitchell, the Premier of WA, to get the Commonwealth Bank to actually send the money over. And Norman didn't actually get his hands on those aircraft until 10 days before the, the service was due to start. This was the sort of pressure that he was working under. It must, it must have been a nightmare. Uh, well, they worked virtually right through the nights and they got four aircraft assembled and air tested by the 3rd of December. Uh, had a big function at Langley Park uh, with plenty of joy rides at uh, five bucks each, uh, five quid each. Norman wasn't slow on that. And uh, 
They threw, flew three aircraft up to Geraldton on the, on the Sunday, the 4th of December, but already Norman was beginning to realise that there was one big problem looming that he had never had anything to time to do about. He had never flown over the route. Now, the government said, we'll prepare the aerodromes and the emergency landing grounds. We've let that out to subcontractors in all these towns, so that'll be fine. The, the, you, you'll have all your aerodromes all set up and ready. But Norman never had gone and had a look at them. He sent Arthur Blake up to Geraldton the day before to find out what the Geraldton ground was like, and Blake cabled back and said, it's dreadful, absolutely, you couldn't land on it. I've had to hire a field from a local farmer uh, just nearby. That field, incidentally, is still currently the main Geraldton airport. And that made Norman think, oh my God, if, if it's like that at Geraldton, what's it like at Carnarvon and Port Hedland and Onslow? He was very soon to find out. Well, on the 5th of December, off they went on the big adventure. Really, in one Avro, flying himself and uh, M.P. Durack, the politician. The second aircraft was flown by Len Taplin, uh, carrying a journalist, Harold Bowers. And the third aircraft was <coughs> flown by young Bob Fawcett, carrying a mechanic, Ted Broad. Now, the, the general impression you get of the way Norman worked was ruthless efficiency. But that wasn't really the case. While he had two very, very good pilots in Kingsford Smith and Lynn Taplin, Robert Fawcett had only flown for three hours since 1919. In three hours and two years. He was really a very inexperienced pilot. Um, Arthur Blake was very much the same. And Val Abbott, who could fly, but was actually given the job uh, simply because he was a solicitor for Norman Brearley, and he wanted to wear his uniform and walk around Perth and you know, I don't think he ever flew in the, in the airline service at all. Well, Taplin had Magneto trouble an hour out of Geraldton, put the aircraft down at Murchison Downs, causing minor damage, forced it, flew around and around in circles above him, dropped his airspeed, stalled, crashed, killed himself and broad. And Brearley's dreams and aspirations were in absolute tatters. Um, I want you to try and imagine what it must have been like for him after all this work and to realise that it was over. Brearley landed nearby. They wouldn't let him look at the wreck. They wouldn't let him look at the bodies. He was so distressed. The, one of the women on the Murchison House down station said it was the first time she'd ever seen a man cry. Um, well, he had incredible recuperative powers. The next morning, uh, he got himself together and he said to Durak, we're going to go on. Durak said, no, you're not. Come and meet this guy. He's got something to tell you. And he introduced him to a man called Frederick Johnston, who, by incredible coincidence, was the brother of the Edgar Johnson that you've just been introduced to. Frederick Johnson was a, a government surveyor and he'd been sent up by the government to just check that the airfields were all okay. And he got hold of Burley, he said, don't, don't even think about going up there, it's a disaster area. He said, at Carnarvon, they built arena stones 200 feet in diameter for you to land in. <laughs> uh, at Onslow, they made a quite a reasonable aerodrome, but just so you know where it is, they built a 10 foot high can of stones right in the middle of it. <laughs> and he said, these people have never seen an aerodrome before, they've never seen an aeroplane before. So, Brearley was persuaded to come back to Perth and start all over again. Um, he got a, uh, the, the, uh, he copped a lot of flack over this accident. But Norman had already learned that attack is the best means of defence, the old wartime thing. And instead of bowing his head in shame, he sailed into the department for their failure to produce decent aerodromes, and he virtually blamed them for Fawcett's death. And he was so successful in this that the government had to back down and say, well, sorry, Norman, yes, we did make a bit of a dog's breakfast of all of this, and we'll fix it up. And so the, the aerodromes were rapidly redone and fixed up. 
by Book Kilbury, he was able to get a, a short service going to Port Hedland. And um, by April, the, the whole service was underway again. And from then on, things went extremely well. The Bristol Tourers were quite a robust aircraft. They cruised at about 95 miles an hour. Um, they had Sidley Puma engines, 225 horsepower Sidley Pumas, and they were water-cooled, which was a little bit unfortunate when you were flying up to the northwest of WA in the summer. Uh, they had to make a lot of rapid alterations to them to fit header tanks and, and extra water supplies. They always carried a supply of water strapped to the undercarriage. Uh, it was pretty pretty rough flying. The aerodromes had been fixed, but only in the loosest possible way. And from then on, there was a, a, a constant stream of undercarriage failures and wingtip failures and props being broken. And, um, it, by our standards today, it was a, a Keystone Cops operation. But the best advice that I ever got from an, an aviation historian in, in the Eastern States was, he said, if you're talking about something that happened in 1921, you can't judge it by today's standards. You must put yourself back into 91, into 1921, and judge it by the standards of the day. And by the standards of the day, this was all perfectly normal. No problems at all. You know, this is, this is what people had learned to expect from aeroplanes. Well, um, Norman got by by virtually disregarding the rules. In fact, he quite publicly stated that he made all the rules in Western Australia and he obeyed every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> These are the pilots that he, he used. Uh, from the left, Norman Brearley, Kingsford Smith, Bob Fawcett, and then Taplin. Uh, there's a lot of photographs around of these guys standing in beautiful uh, RFC and RAF uniforms at Langley Park. Uh, that, that was a show photo. This is actually how they flew aeroplanes. Uh, the uniforms were not all that smart, but that was, that was the way things were done in 1921. <laughs> that was the crash site at Murchison Downs. Um, and at first look, you'd think, well, that's the end of that aeroplane, but no, it was actually rebuilt. Um, uh, that they were relatively simple aircraft to repair, and he was able to actually get that back into the air again some months later, which is quite incredible, really. Uh, not the sort of thing you can do with a 747. Well, the disregard of the rules was such that on one occasion when Len Taplin was in Broome and he wanted to go back to Port Hedland, King Smith said, well, I can't take you, I've got a full load of two passengers. So Tappan said, so I'll sit on the wing. <laughs> and he sat on the wing from Broome down to Port Hedland. And that wasn't considered anything particularly outstanding. Uh, compared to what they'd been doing over the battlefields of France, this was pretty, pretty pushy stuff. Uh, the, the, everyone was taken out to Mayland's aerodrome on this uh, truck, which you can see has been approved by WorkSafe Work Australia. <laughs> and, safe. Uh, and again, this was the attitude of the times. So no, nobody thought there was anything strange in that at all. It was a perfectly normal way of getting around. Well, the service went for the next three or four years very successfully, and Norman realised that the Bristol tourists were getting pretty, pretty near the end of their useful life. They only carried two people, and he'd been to England in 1924 and he'd seen this aircraft, the de Havilland DH-50, which was a civilianised version of the DH-9. Uh, still had a Puma engine, but it had a cabin and could take four passengers in rather more comfort, if you use the word comfort in the loosest possible sense, uh, than the Bristol Tourers. So he bought two of these in 1924 and had them shipped out to WA uh, with a third one to follow, and um, he saw these as being the first sort of proper airliners that he'd got. Um, now, in 1925, he began to run into some real regulation problems, and this is where Norman began to show the department what they were up against. They'd got a tiger by the tail, well and truly. They wrote to Norman and they said, 
Um, we've had word from the Air Ministry in England that the, the wing spars on the Bristol Tours have reached their use-by date. So be a good chap, will you? Bring them all down to Perth and put new wing spars. Um, Norman said, yeah, I'll think about that. Two months later, he hadn't done anything, so they said, what's happening? He said, oh, yeah, I was a bit busy. Um, yeah, okay, as they come down to Perth for maintenance, I'll replace the wing spars. They said, no, Norman, bring them all down to Perth and replace the wing spars. So Norman said, well, I can't do that. I'm running an aerial, aerial service. And they said, well, you've got three DH-50s to get on with. So Norman thought about it for a couple of months. And then he wrote to the department and said, anyway, problem solved. He said, I've been in touch with Frank Barnwell, who designed the Bristol Tour. He's in Australia at the moment, would you believe, at Point Cook. And he wrecked this load of rubbish. The Brings the Brin Spars have got a 10-year service life. So the department wrote back and said, we don't you we think of a monkey's what Frank Barnwell says. Just replace the wing spar. <laughs> Nothing happened for a couple of months. And they said, Norman, if you don't do something, we'll deregister the airline. So he wrote back and he said, well, actually, I've sold two of the Bristol tours to Kingsford Smith and Keith Anderson. And the other ones are went to scrap. So thanks for the note. Have a nice day. <laughs> they, they caught up with Kingsford Smith and Anderson when they landed at Mascot and slapped rich stickers on the Bristols and, and, and they had to replace them. They were not happy and they wrote a, a letter to Brinsmead telling them exactly what they thought of Major Norman Brewery, DSO. And uh, he sold the other two to Tommy O'Day who started barn sawing around WA within them. And he had the very neat trick of always leaving his forwarding address as the last address he'd been at. <laughs> and after, after two years of trying to find him, they gave up. <laughs> I think they began to realise that, that Norman was going to be a little bit of a problem. Well, Norman very quickly became more than a little bit of a problem. He became very much of a problem. Um, <clears throat> A little bit of that. Not a little bit of that. Uh, in 1925, 1926, he informed the department he was going to totally reform his company. Um, he was going to put Western Australian Airways into voluntary liquidation. And he was going to start a new company called West Australian Airways. And he was going to pass over from the old company to the new company everything that they needed to operate the service. Uh, the department said, well, what are, you, what are you doing it for? What's the point? And he said, well, I'm doing a lot of business overseas, and I haven't really got much of an image. He said, I want a company that's got more image, with more capital, more shareholders, uh, you know, a, a much bigger presence. And the department said, well, all right, you, you know, seem to know what you're doing. So Norman passed over the DH-50s, the three DH-50s he had, all the hangars, the infrastructure, the workshops, so on and so forth, and everything was going sweetly, except he seemed to have forgotten that he had a £10,000 reserve fund built up. This four shillings a mile that he was getting was too much. And he built up 10,000 quid in a reserve fund. Now the department knew about this and they thought it was because he was going to buy three more DH-50s. It wasn't. It went back into the shareholders' pockets. So in 1926, he finished with Western Australian Airways, and in 1927, West Australian Airways started up uh, with no reserve fund. So how was Norman going to buy three DH-50s? Very simple. In, towards the end of 1927, an astute accountant in the, the uh, finance section of the Defence Department noticed that the maintenance costs of the aircraft and the fleet had skyrocketed. So an investigation was made and it was found that Norman had built three new DH-50s at Maylands and charged them to maintenance, <laughs> not to capital. And as the cost of maintenance was brought into the calculations on the subsidy, it virtually meant the government had paid for these three DH-50s. <laughs> <laughs> they were not very happy. They went to the Solicitor General and the Solicitor General said, well, you, you idiots wrote the contract. You didn't put anything in the contract to stop this happening. You made your bed lie on it. And, and they couldn't do anything. They just had to accept it. Now, Edgar Johnson um, found that this was very distasteful. And he started a mental notebook. And he put down a mark, Brearley has been very, very naughty. And 
to put this mental notebook away. Well, uh, 1928 came around, uh, and the department said, we're going to start an aerial mail service between Perth and Adelaide. The reason being, even though it duplicates the transcontinental railway, the reason that we're doing it is because the, the mail boats come into Fremantle on Monday mornings, and the mail's put on the transcontinental express, well, the transcontinental train, it averages 20 miles an hour across the Melbourne, and um, we, we need to get the mail to, to the eastern states more quickly. So, an airline service. They put out a contract, but this time they decided not to do it on a shillings per mile basis, they'd try something different. And the contract said that they would pay 12 and 8 pence a pound for every pound of air mail carried, uh, up to 800 pounds. And they guaranteed that there would be a payment for 600 pounds on every flight. So if, if they'd only given 100 pounds of mail, they still paid for 600. Now this worked out to 380 pounds a flight from Perth to Adelaide. Norman must have taken the whole family out to a slap-up restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there was more. In the contract, for some inexplicable reason, they said if for any period of time, uh, for, four, for four months in succession, the weight of mail increases to over 800 pounds, we will double the subsidy from 380 pounds a flight to 760 pounds. Norman must have sort of said, oh, frumptious joy. <laughs> now, one of his shareholders was a man called John Charles, who operated a big real estate agency in Perth. And he went to John Charles and he said, I've got a deal for you. I'll, I'll give you 6,000 quid to promote the whole idea of this airline. Um, if it works, keep the 6,000. If it's not, you can keep 3,000. So all of a sudden, about three weeks after the service started, which had been carrying about 250 pounds a mile of flight, I might say, it went up to about six or 700. And then it went over 800. And for the next two months, it was averaging anything up to 1,100 pounds a flight. And the Postmaster General got hold of the surveyors and said, what what's going on? And uh, it appeared that Charles was sending advertising pamphlets to the Eastern States. <laughs> um, <laughs> he sent them... Um, um, I, I, I think I've got a, a little bit of a note here. Um, the, uh, <coughs> Over a period of two months, he sent something like 13,000 of these heavy pamphlets to the Eastern States, advertising real estate in WA. <laughs> and of course, up, the subsidy was going to go up. So the Civil Aviation Board were tearing over to the Solicitor General. They thought, oh, not again. I said, what are we going to do? And they said, nothing. <laughs> you wrote the contract. <laughs> it's not illegal. <laughs> and. Uh, Apparently the Postmaster General took pity on them and said, it's all right, take it, calm down. I'll pass a bylaw saying that if anything, any shipment is more than 50 pounds in weight, it's got to be officially sanctioned. So of course that stopped the scheme, left Charles holding 2,000 pounds worth of stamps, 10,000 unsold, <laughs> uh, and Edgar Johnson got his book out and said, this time he's been very, very guilty. <laughs> um, well, Norman decided that this, this was going to be the aeroplane for the flight. He bought four of these things, uh, DH-66s. Uh, they were state-of-the-art in England at the time, but they were not state-of-the-art in America at the time. The Americans used to fall about laughing when they saw things like this. But you couldn't buy American air aircraft. The, America and Germany had never signed the International Convention of Air Navigation in 1919. And so Australia, being loyal to Britain to the core, refused to allow any aircraft from either America or Germany to be imported into Australia. They made a slight exception in New Guinea uh, because the, the German um, 
the Junkers were the only things that could fly there safely. But you couldn't get American aircraft. So the, the Australians were stuck with this sort of thing. Um, Frank Cohn said to me, it had a magnificent built-in headwind. <laughs> uh, I can see the point. It had three Jupiter 6 engines, it cruised at 95 miles an hour, it took 14 people, uh, 15 hours to fly from Perth to Adelaide, stopping overnight at Forest. It used a gallon of petrol a minute, and for a 15 hour flight, that meant that Norman was looking at around about a thousand gallon of petrol fuel bill for every flight. And all of a sudden, he realised that this wonderful contract that he got was really not that good because the depreciation rate on these things was about two and nine pence a mile and he was only getting five shillings a mile on this wonderful contract that he had. And he had a lot of other problems as well. So in 1930 he went to the department and he said, look, I've, I've made a bit of a blue, uh, wrong plane, I'm going to sell them and buy something better. And there's a beauty, it's just come out in, in, in England called the Vickers V Astra. It's a high wing, all metal aircraft, much, much better. Cruises is 150, it's going to be just the job. So the department said, well, no, you're not going to sell all your DH-66s. If you needed four of them for the, for the service, you still look still going to need four aircraft, so you can sell two and keep two. So Norman flogged two of them off to Imperial Airways, who were crashing their way between Cairo and Karachi. <laughs> only, only 11 of these things were built, and, and the Imperial Airways had already wiped off five of them. <laughs> and so they eagerly bought two of Normans, uh, paying, no doubt, top dollar, plus a premium, plus a buyer's percentage, I should think. And he decided that he would get something better. Uh, incidentally, one of Normans' little side issues was Every time the DH-66 arrived from Adelaide on a Sunday afternoon, the mechanics would rip all the seats out, they put in those wooden forms that you used to get at school, you know, two legs and a wooden form, and they'd cram 30 people into the thing and take them around Perth for joy flight. Frank Hearn said it was, watching them get into the aircraft was like the Keystone Cops where all the Indians go behind the tree and disappear. Well now, the department had anticipated that Norman was up to all sorts of naughty things in WA, so they decided it was about time they had a permanent inspector. And they picked a bloke called Jim Colopy, who was a, a good engineer and a very loyal departmental man. And they sent him to Perth to start to keep an eye on what was going on over in the Wild West. When he left Melbourne in the train to go to Adelaide, Johnson went down to see him off. And as he was walking alongside the train, as it slowly picked up speed, talking to Colby through the window, his last words were, get Greeley. <laughs> well, Colby lived up to his name. When this little thing happened, he nearly had a seizure. And his cables were sent back. Greeley was told to stop putting 30 people in the Hercules. <laughs> Start to behave like a normal human being. Didn't, didn't affect Norman at all. He probably had a good chuckle. Um, well, anyway, the, the Hercules went. But while this was going on, quite an interesting happen thing happened that nobody took any notice of. One day at Wyndham, this aircraft arrived. It was a Fokker F7 trimotor owned by KLM. And they were the, the Dutch were very advanced in their intercontinental flying. And they ran this thing down from Batavia to Wyndham with a, a sack of mail from Australia, and it flew onto the eastern states. And uh, Norman's mob at Wyndham serviced it for them. And Norman thought to himself, KLM, Wyndham, here's a bit of a thing, I might think about this. And he put it away in his mind, uh, as you will see. Well, that's what they bought. Uh, it had two uh, Jupiter 11s, which were uh, a geared engine. They were not a direct drive Jupiter like the six, they were a geared engine, so they ran at a higher speed, they were more economical. Um, and within, the first one arrived in February 1931, and within three months, the airways mechanics had christened them the Vickers disasters. They were dreadful. The sheeting used to peel off the wings, 
they had constant problems with the, the framework of the aircraft. In Britain, it was not permitted to weld aircraft frames. Britain would allow, wouldn't allow welding. Everything had to be bolted to construction. They didn't trust welds. Um, but the worst thing was the engines. Um, these geared engines uh, gave uh, one particular problem. Uh, they were not fitted with a cylinder head temperature gauge. And Norman's instructions to these pilots were get up to cruising altitude and then lean the mixture out as far as you can go because I want to save petrol. Well, leaning the mixture out was great, but it didn't do a lot for the cylinder head temperature. And these bristles were fitted with solid stem valves. They didn't have hollow sodium fill valves. And they used to break the, the heads off the valves. And because the prop was windmilling, this valve was rushed around the engine, wrecking enormous havoc. Well, Norman very quickly went through his uh, stock of spare engines, and uh, <coughs> they became very adept at fitting a Jupiter 11 on one side <laughs> and a Jupiter 6 on the other. So you've got a Jupiter 6 here and a Jupiter 11 there. Frank Cahoon made up a conversion kit uh, that they could rush out and it adapted all the, the oil lines and the fuel lines from one engine to the other. And he said, finally, almost the whole of the fleet was flying asymmetrically. Um, Col Colby noted all this with great interest and uh, reported it all back to his masters. Well, <coughs> the, the, the Astra didn't reach 150 miles an hour cruising speed and Norman had been smart enough to put into the contract a penalty clause and he picked up quite a nice little sum because they could only get up to about 140 with a brisk following wind. And um, you can see on this particular one, the, uh, it was quite convenient actually. The, the, the distressed engine was taken back to, <laughs> to Maylands to some attempt to try and rebuild it. <coughs> well, in 1933, Harry Baker was taking off from Maylands and a prop broke off, went through the side of the cabin, and with an incredible display of airmanship, uh, Baker brought the thing down in a, in a vegetable garden in Bridgecliffe, and nobody was injured except one passenger who broke his arm because he stood up as the aircraft was landing, fell over and broke his arm. Well, Burley rushed out to the scene of the accident, and so did Colby. And Colby said, Norman, what's happened? He said, oh, bird strike. <laughs> red, <laughs> red. You see, feathers. Look at the engine, the cell, these feathers. So Colby took some of the feathers, went into the, the WA Museum, and gave them to the ornithologist, and said, could you tell me anything about it? And the ornithologist said, yes, they're bird feathers, but if it was a bird strike, it's the first time I've heard of a black Orpington hen flying at four <laughs> The aircraft has hit the chuck on the way down. <laughs> well, really immediately wrote that one off. And I think he applied for the insurance that afternoon. Couldn't get it out fast enough. Um, now, 1933 was going to be a very bad year for Norman. Um, Horace yeah, Brinsmead, mate. the controller of civil aviation, had been one of Rinsmead's loyal supporters. He knew he was sort of pushing the envelope a bit, but he, he believed that really had the right stuff, and he, he knew that he could do the job, and he did. He, he, he claimed he'd never killed a paying passenger in the whole of his airline. Anyhow, in 1933, bad year for Norman. Um, Brinsmead, his great friend, had, had got, tried to fly to England in one of Charles Kingford Smith's new airline pockets started Australian National Airways with Charles Arm. And they got to Malaysia and the aircraft crashed. Not badly, but it couldn't go on. So Smith said, don't worry, we'll send another one up. Vinsmith said, don't worry, the, the Dutch are here, they've got a, a, another Fokker here, they're going to Europe, they've offered me a free seat. That crashed at Bangkok, killing five people and very severely injuring Horace Vinsmith to the point where he never recovered. It took him months before they could bring him back to Australia. He was crippled, par paralyzed. 
and he died eventually in 1934. But this meant that Edgar Johnson, who was the acting controller, now moved up to the top seat. And Brewery certainly didn't take anybody out for a dinner that night. He thought, here's trouble. He was absolutely right. Um, in 1933, an even greater development occurred. The British got hold of the Australian government and said, look, we're, we're, this business of sending mail out on mail boats takes 30 odd days, hopeless. We've got to start flying mail from England to Australia. What about if we try to get a scheme going? We call it the Empire Air Mail Scheme. We'll, we're flying to Karachi at the moment. We'll fly on to Singapore. And you people down in, in Oz can take over from Singapore to Darwin and to Brisbane. And when you get the mail to Australia, you can distribute it um, by any means you like. Well, the Australians were pretty cautious about this. They wanted to know how much they were get get paid. It was going to be very expensive. But after a lot of negotiations, uh, and when I say a lot of negotiations, I was lucky enough to get all the correspondence over from from uh, Melbourne, and there was 25 kilograms of paper. <laughs> Quite an interesting read. Really. But finally an agreement was reached. Uh, de Havilland's would design a special airliner called the DH-86. It was a four-engined aircraft, could cruise at 150, 155 miles an hour. Um, and it would fly out to Singapore with Imperial Airways, and then some new company formed in Australia would take over. Well now, Bruni thought to himself, this could either be a, a, a winner or a loser, because it's going to mean the end of the, of the air mail, so the, the mail boat service. So there won't be any need to fly mail from Perth to Adelaide. So that's going to be the end of that service. It's okay. I've, I've still got the the, um, the Perth to to Wyndham service, and it turned out that the Wyndham service was going to be extended across to Catherine, so it could intercept the DH86 coming from Darwin and bring the Perth mail down to Perth. So Norman thought, right, well that, that's a lay down as air. I'll get that. I've been on the route now for 13 years. I know every blade of grass on the way, uh, and I'm a trusted loyal servant, uh, so I'll get that contract, but what about the one from Darwin to Singapore? So he contacted Charles Arm at Australian National Airways, not the second ANA, the first one, and he contacted Hudson Fish at Qantas and said, why don't we all get together and form a company to do this run from Darwin to Brisbane? Well, they thought this was a good idea, so he went over to Sydney and met them didn't work out too well. Hudson Fish was a very uh, straight, uh, gentlemanly fellow who stuck to the rules rigidly, and Charles Alm and Burley were not, and they just didn't get on. Uh, Hudson Fish found Alm was aggressive and bombastic, and in a letter to Edgar Johnson, he said, and I couldn't trust Brearley any further than I could kick him. <laughs> um, he had very good reason for that, as it turned out. Well, the negotiations dragged on for a while, and finally, um, Hudson Fish thought, no, I've had this. I can't stand these people. So he went to Imperial Airways on the side, and he said to Imperial Airways, what about we form a company to fly from Darwin to, to, to from Singapore to Darwin? Imperial Airways thought this was a marvellous idea. And so they formed a new company called Qantas Empire Airways, and they put in a tender for the service. That left Brearley and Alm as the other tenderers. They put in 13 tenders using a variety of aircraft from from Vickers Veloxes to uh, Armstrong with Atalantas, and a very incredible complicated tender. I was so confident of getting the, the Perth to Catherine service that with new aircraft, with, with Dragons, that I, I really haven't kept my fleet up to scratch. And really the stuff I've got now is, is, is not, not really airworthy. So what are you going to do about it? And the department said, we've got, got to send the aircraft inspectors over to go right over your fleet and, and withdraw all those certificates of airworthiness unless you do something about it. And Norman had to overhaul all his aircraft to get his sea rails back. Um, and he was beginning to sail into some very troubled waters. He began to realise that the department 
had become aware of his tactics and, and they were now quite equal to him. So he, swall he swallowed his pride and he accepted the inevitable. Right. He already brought one dragon out from England. Right. And uh, uh, that was URE. And he immediately ordered a second one, URO, and he operated the Perth to Adelaide service with these two aircraft. Uh, he had no contract, no subsidy. Um, luckily, there was a fair bit of traffic on the route, air, uh, passenger traffic and freight traffic. Uh, there was no mail, of course, only the, only the Perth to Adelaide mail was all that he could get. And the Postmaster General said, I'll pay you eight bob a pound for that, if that helps. And Norman said, well, thank you, sir, tugging his ball off. And uh, so that carried on uh, until the beginning of 1936. Now, while all this was going on, there was a broker over in the Eastern States called Holliman, Ivan Holliman. He owned Holliman's Airways, and he had the same sort of aspirations of grandeur that Norman had had when he was a younger man. And Holliman decided that he wanted to control civil aviation in Australia. So he started off buying up a couple of small airlines in Victoria, you know, West, Western, Southern Pacific, uh, Provincial, a couple of other small airlines. He went to Adelaide Airways and he said, um, I think we need to all get together on this. Now, Adelaide Airways were owned by the Adelaide Steamship Company. Holliman's Airways were owned by the Holliman Steamship Company. And he went to Hullet Parker and Orient Line and said, let's form a consortium and really get a grip on Australian aviation. So they agreed and a consortium was formed. Um, it, had a, it was capitalised to the extent of uh, half a million pounds, and Norman looked at all this and thought, I'm not going to be able to compete with this. This is too much. What am I going to do? Surrender? No. He wrote to the press and said, I'm back in the game, fighting fit, and I'm really going to give them the stick and show them what, what I'm made of. I've ordered two Lockheed 10s from America. I'm going to run a, a Perth to Adelaide to Sydney service overnight, uh, and I'm going to get back into control of Australian aviation. Well, Ivan Holliman looked at this and thought, uh, we've got to do something about this guy. So he said to Adelaide, Adelaide Airways, you be my front man, go and offer him a deal. Offer him 25,000 bucks walk in, walk out for his airline. So they went to Norman and said, um, we'll give you 25,000 pounds, walk in, walk out. And Norman thought they'd offer over for about a nanosecond and said, done. <laughs> <laughs> and Holloman realised that it, the, the, the base had been cast and he'd swallowed it, hook, line and sink. <laughs> so Norman then wound up West Australian Airways. He distributed all the reserves, and they were very liberal reserves, to the shareholders. He altered the share structure of the entire company uh, so that the shares could be fully paid up and paid out. And um, uh, he passed over what was left of West Australian Airways to uh, Holliman, who by this time had formed ANA uh, on the 30th of June. For their trouble, they got um, one dragon, that was the URE. He'd already sold URO. Uh, he bought a Rapide, a Dragon Rapide, they got that. They got one crashed Viastra, and one Viastra technically still working, but not. Uh, they got three or four DH-50s, which were all had their CFAs withdrawn, um, and Norman walked away with 70,000 pounds, <laughs> which on today's money is around about 14 million. Um, he said in an interview, I threw my cards on the table and I picked up my winnings and I left with a very, very big smile on my face. <laughs> Norman, I saw you wink at me about four times. <laughs> uh, he was a, 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 a great bloke. Uh, I, I'm so sorry I never ever met him, but uh, uh, he was the sort of person that uh, was the right man at the right time in the right place. He did a hell of a lot for Australian aviation. He, he showed the way. He showed how airlines could be run and could be run profitably. And 
unlike John Larkin in Victoria, who finished up growing geraniums on the Isle of Guernsey, um, he, he, he made some real money out of it. Hudson Fish carried on, didn't retire until 1966, a very tired and ill and broken man. By this time, he'd lost Qantas to the government. And Norman, I think, really played his cards beautifully. Um, I don't think we'll see the like of him again, unfortunately. Thank you very much indeed. Whatever happened to Edgar Johnson? Well, Norman must have had a little bit of a chuckle about Edgar Johnson, because in 1938, the government decided it was high time that uh, a Department of Civil Aviation was formed. Uh, they'd been previously just a branch of the Defence Department, and this one was working out. And so, um, H.V. Thorby was made the new Minister for Aviation, and he had to appoint his staff. Well, Johnson, who was the controller of civil aviation, was the obvious choice to, to become Director General. But Thorby was keen enough to get a committee of three independent public servants to have a look at the staff of the Civil Aviation Board to see whether they were... This is what they said about Johnson. A man of good mental level and with some force of character, but egotistical, dogmatic, and unyielding in his view. Somewhat narrow in his conception of the administrative outlook required in a rapidly growing department, probably due to a wider administrative train, lack of wider administrative training and experience. His courageous, loyal, uh, to dispose of matters promptly by, but he unable to dispose of matters promptly by making firm and final decisions. Considered unsuitable for office of controller general because of his narrow outlook but should be capable of giving good service in another position in a new organisation, where his experience and zeal would undoubtedly be of value. So we took the answers. Um, he made Corbett Director General of Aviation. Johnson was the Assistant Director, and he never, ever became the full director. And I think uh, Norman probably sent him a telegram sort of saying, bad luck, Edgar. Have a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> When I was looking through a list of initial shareholders of Western Australian Airways, one name sprang out. It was Yeo. And I thought, I've heard that name before. So I got in touch with Mal, and he said, yes, that was my grandfather's cousin. So we have in the audience today uh, one of the Yeo family that went right back to ownership of Western Australian Airways.